Ryan Blue Bowen is on the show. Now, before we say, oh, just for the people to know, Ryan is one of the leading arm wrestling YouTubers, someone that I used to watch personally a couple of years ago before I stopped arm wrestling, maybe two years and a half ago is the last time I was following your channel. And Ryan is on the channel because I recently made a, uh, I don't know how to even describe it, but uh, I, <laughs> I made a comment in an interview which was uh, really harsh. Uh, I said it out of my what I was thinking at the time, genuinely, and I wanted to give Ryan an opportunity to fill us in on what I may be missing and so on. But before we do, I'd like to also say to the audience, you know, I live by a code. I don't call people out to uh, defame them or to harm them. In fact, I usually don't call people out on YouTube unless even when they make mistakes in biology that are severe, I usually don't mention that unless I feel that someone is doing something insidious or lying intentionally. So my audience will know that I rarely call people out and I want my audience to know I don't pick on people that I think are weak and I don't pick on somebody that I don't think can take it. So me mentioning Ryan originally was actually a, a statement that I think he could take that you know, comment. And I wasn't trying to pick on you, Ryan, at all. Um, yeah, but, but before I begin, I have some, I don't, this is not going to be a biopic about Ryan, but I do have some brief questions. One has been nugging at me for a few years. How is your nickname Blue? And you're the most redheaded person. Well, how did you get the name Blue? I'm very curious. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's like calling a big guy tiny. Um, it's actually uh, oh. synonymous with World War One. Um, Australian soldiers in World War One. Uh, that had red hair were commonly called blue um, just by, by their fellow comrades. So I was in the yeah. army and the nickname, the nickname was given to me when I was at the top of a, a rope tower and the, the physical training instructor didn't, didn't know my name, just yelled out, Hey blue. Uh, <laughs> and it's stuck ever since. So it just flowed into arm wrestling. But yeah, okay, that's, that is, that is that's, a funny, that is a funny reason for the <laughs> So you were originally in the in the military, and then you sort of transitioned into full time arm wrestling, didn't you? Was it? Yeah, sort of yeah. For me, I, I joined the military straight out of high school. Um, so I was uh, I, 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 from eighteen through to twenty twenty six. I was I was in the army. Um, arm wrestling. I loved arm wrestling all along. I, I just didn't know it was a professional sport. I'd I'd made efforts to become a professional tennis player as a, as a teenager. I got close. Didn't make it, joined the army. And then when I when I discovered arm wrestling, it was like, oh, hang on a second. I realized that the average age of world champs was, at least in the North American scene, seemed to be around 40. So I was like, I haven't missed the boat. Uh, let's get involved in arm wrestling. And, and, I, and I literally haven't, haven't looked back. That was day one. Uh, I, I got the bug instantly. So, yeah. You know, that's that's actually what got me into arm wrestling. I was getting into sports again in my late 20s, and I thought there's no sport I can really excel at. But then I noticed these arm wrestlers were peaking in their 40s, which mm. is a suspicious <laughs> thing, actually, if you think about it. When you were initially it's, it's, arm wrestling and adapting to it, the, I know the adaptations for the people that haven't arm wrestled, the first year or so feels like you have a toothache across your arm. And that involves mm. actually damage to the arm. I always yeah. wondered, you're, in fact, your style is, is uh, maybe after Todd Hutchings, is particularly potentially damaging, and you've gotten a lot of heat for that certain movement you've been using. Do you, mm. Did you initially worry that you are handicapping yourself for life? Because this is what turned you know, me <laughs> back off. Physically. You know, I, if, 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 if a physiotherapist looks at my body, if I stand there, my right shoulder sits lower than my left. Um, I actually brought that with me from tennis. Growing up, playing tennis full-time, like I was four hours a day, five days a week as a kid changed the shape of my body um i didn't realize arm wrestling would change the shape of my body as well but certainly my my range of, of motion on my right arm is significantly reduced and changed uh, it's not michael todd level but it's but it's i can see how if i keep doing this for another 10 15 years i might be michael todd level range of motion on my arm um but it it, it didn't worry me nothing none of that worried me the the fascinating thing um so Prior to me starting arm wrestling, I'd come off uh, a really serious back injury. When I was in the in the military, I was in a parachuting accident, and I did my L4, L5 disc, and I wasn't able to walk for a, for a year and a half. When I say wasn't able to walk, I mean, I walked with a, with assistance, and it was a big nerve pain every time I put my foot down. Um, and so I atrophied. I was an athlete prior to that injury. I was in the military, strong, fit, um, weighing about 86 kilos, 87 kilos, I uh, got that injury and I atrophied down to this skinny, fat, 75, 74 kilos. And often people have seen photos of me and think that that's my genetic start point for the sport. 
it's it's kind of a it somewhat is it's my gen it's truly my genetic base when I've done nothing for for two years I was I was essentially bedridden for a number of years prior to starting uh, arm wrestling and it was and arm wrestling excited me because I thought I thought of it as, as a simplistic sport in in terms of its overall body physicality. It's funny I I thought that because I realize now how much more involved it is. But it was a, a sport that, despite still carrying the effects of the back injury, um, when I commenced arm wrestling, I was still having big back problems. Uh, I thought it was a sport that I can I can work on my hand and wrist no matter how bad my my back is hurting. So it's interesting that the, the forty year old genetic potential or seeing that I, I i always resonated with what my dad had said to me my dad was a farmer and um quite heavily into manual labor all his life and he always said to me he was felt he was at his physically strongest when he was 40 years old and um so i looked at that and thought yeah shit yeah i can do it I'll, I'll i didn't make it in tennis let's see if i can make it in arm wrestling and and yeah so it, but i was equally like you quite fascinated when i look at the the peak age of of the sport and it does seem to vary from the eastern europeans they peak a lot younger the north americans yeah they peak in 40s to 50s which is fascinating <laughs> have you ever this is very off topic but have you ever heard of jason blaha no no oh there's there, there someone's gonna comment on the fact that you mentioned you're a bedrid and i just i wanted to mention that ahead of time we right. should be careful of any any similarities to jason blah in the future because <laughs> anyway, i'll get to it i'll get to it later but yeah, there'll be some Honestly, have, have you have you seen have you seen the photo by any chance of me that is that bedridden version of me that was the i, I mean I, I i've cheekily used it as a before and after for arm wrestling for me before because it, I, I truly look pathetic as an athlete like I look so weak and I look soft and skinny and and that was truly where I started, started no, my, my, my recollection of you is, is as if it was yesterday the last time I saw your channel which was two and a half years ago so mm -hmm. I, I saw I came and opened your channel again and I didn't know the arm wrestling content on YouTube exploded and I'd been mm -hmm. busy away doing my YouTube channel about a sub, separate subject and I noticed yeah. there was all this content on YouTube so I wanted to catch up and when I went to your channel I noticed oh this guy looks different so this is where yeah. this is where it really all began you saw the before you saw yeah. the big I, I, not the before picture I looked at I saw your youtube yeah, yeah, just a, yeah. well I, I still think i still think if I, I i'm shocked at what i uh look like when i look back and see myself in the competing in the under 80 kilos class i th i feel like i look like a cancer patient like that's what i feel like well, like looking at it now i know i'm thicker now in every respect um i my, my i now walk i, I waited 93.5 kilos this morning after taking a piss naked so that's a lot bigger than than uh than i was back then <laughs> well you were a little lanky but to be honest what i would say you looked like was natural uh, you looked mm. like a, a normal androgen level person well we'll get into that in a second but this is just yeah, my yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> but but i wanted to mention something how has this growth in the youtube because you were very active on youtube just as you are now but at the time mm. there was really a limited limited mm. channels how has this yeah. growth affected you i know you have a merchandise company that you've recently created yeah. have you been well, when, when I when, when, I, when I when I commenced the journey of arm wrestling, I, I said to myself, I want to make it a career. And I knew that there was just, at the time, no prize money in the sport, especially at the amateur and low low level pro. Um, so I, I, I straight away said, well, all right, YouTube and start a business around arm wrestling. And I did that from the beginning and it took a long time for it to establish itself, um, obviously. Uh, uh, it took me four and a half years to make $36 my, in revenue on YouTube. Um oh. And yeah, well now now my now my YouTube channel, I uh, I don't mind, but I'm transparent with my YouTube earnings. I made twenty eight hundred US this month on on YouTube. Um, and the arm wrestling social media scene in general, I think I think it's uh, it's been coming and building for for quite some time over the last eight years that I've been watching anyway. The, um, WAL undoubtedly helped with bringing attention. Devin Larratt himself combined with the WAL saw opportunities like him pulling with half Thor and him getting pulling with Shaq. And those moments were instrumental moments for bringing new audiences. And the people like Juju Mufu getting involved was big people. Now people like Larry getting involved was big. So the last five years, we've seen a few key moments, particularly those ones I just listed come to mind where our audience internationally grew tremendously. And then when COVID killed all the events that were normally happening, 
um, everyone started getting their arm wrestling uh, consumption through YouTube. And so as much as COVID was a pain in the ass for not being able to get, get events on, it actually, I saw massive growth in the COVID period in my channel. Um, you know, I just remembered where the first time I saw you was. It was at a Devin Larat seminar that was filmed in Australia, I think before your yeah. channel started. Was that before the channel started? Yeah, the, the, yeah. Well, that, the, the, that seminar that you were... 2013, Devin came out for the first time to Australia. And I had a super match where Devin refereed it, and I was in the background of that seminar. Yeah, and I had, I had my channel would have had 100 subscribers in. You were asking very astute questions. That's how I remembered you. Actually, I should mention that to the listeners. So, irrespective of whatever conflict we've recently had, your channel has an incredible series called The Breakdown. I highly recommend it to people. You're extremely good at analyzing those matches. And also, additionally, you're, I think, one of the most. Maybe you're a future version of uh, Engen or something like that. You're one of the most proficient technical uh, armors. No, extremely good at explaining. I appreciate that. Yeah, very much so. I appreciate that. That for, for me, uh, and that that comes into this will segue into later conversations. But when I when I started in arm wrestling, I recognized that I wasn't strong. I recognized that mm -hmm. um, that for me to to win. I needed to be better and I needed, and for me to be better, I thought well, I need to understand the biomechanics of every single position there is in arm wrestling and why, why we go there. So still to this day, I, I, I feel I bat above my strength average. I feel like the people I'm balanced with in the sport are stronger than me. If your we super measure the, your super match is yeah. short and the, in the way yeah. the tide turns, you can turn tides, you, you recognize your mistakes and react. And I've always noticed that it's, it's very yeah. commendable. Now, uh, a couple more questions. I wanted to ask about getting matches in arm wrestling because what I've, this all came from the fact that apparently you called out Herman and then RVJ. I just knew about the RVJ one originally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I was curious, is it difficult, especially being in Australia? I, I understand COVID is different, but in being in Australia to get matches to level up, in the rankings. Yeah, 100%. Like, I mean, for me, the, the approach that I've taken to arm wrestling progression for myself was is to seek out losses until you can't find them anymore. And you do that firstly in your local area, then your state, then your country. And at the moment in the in my country, I, there are only two people in the country that realistically I'm still behind. It's Lachlan Adair, Ben Carroll, everyone else I've beaten. And, and, and so for me to continue to progress, I need to look internationally. Um, and... So yeah, it, it is it is hard to travel. I mean, and that's why I'm very blessed that arm wrestling has actually become my business, and I can afford to uh, to pay for travel to go overseas to have opportunities. So the Herman one's an interesting one. The little the backstory for that, and it kind of again links into the the PED stuff. Um, I want to quickly clarify and say that that I call Herman Stevens out uh, for a match. Simply because I actually respect the dude, and I actually think that he is uh, just at the level, regardless of whether he's on gear or not on gear, or wants to be on gear or not, and regardless of what I'm doing, he was just the right guy in the order of progressions out of people that I respect. Like when I look for a match, I look for someone that has that's at the right level for me to challenge myself. I like to be reaching a little bit, and for me, that was Herman. He was above my level. Uh, on reputation and on achievements, he'd definitely done more than me. So I thought, yep, good opportunity. And plus, he's talkative in the world of arm wrestling, so marketing is, a, is naturally a part of my business as well. And like I said, it, irrespective of, of PDs, he was just the right-level guy. Or well, one of the guys out there in North America that was the right-level guy that, that I thought, yeah, I'd love to face him. Um, I don't have like a list. Like I want to, I want to get all the way to to taking on Devin Larratt someday. <laughs> I don't know. But, but. Do you have to do you contact these guys in private first, or do you do you, yeah. or marketing? Yeah. Do you make it a public thing to sort of pressure them? How do you? What's the no, goal? Uh, yeah, th there's there's an art to it. I always call, I always speak privately with with people. Um, Herman was one of those guys, for instance, who was very very reserved on it. He he, uh, as you as you're aware, he typically likes to just pull in Zloty and very rarely stuck his head out in any other sort of super match sense, um, unless it really made sense for him personally. Um, and I always tried to incentivize, uh, I did it with Herman and, I, and he said, no thanks, but I would always try to incentivize like I did with Chance Shaw, for instance, I put $500 on the table and I said to Chance, you don't need to put anything on the table. I'll come to you. I'll put $500 on the table. If I win, I take the 500 back. If you win, you keep the 500. Um, and then I get some content from it and I get, and I also get the opportunity to progress. Um, so I made that off with Herman. He wasn't interested. And, um, 
Yeah. And and the the back and forth between Herman and I over the, the years is, has been um, – I mean, I, I, I always project the confidence in myself. I believe that my progression in the sport is quite it, it is quite steep, and I, I believe that it's still going. And I believe that I I genuine I generally have a good sense of where my reality is at, and it takes a while for um, for everyone else's perceptions to catch up. I like to have I like to always be ahead of where everyone's perceptions are. If people start telling me I'm up here and I know I'm down here, that I'm uncomfortable with that. I want to always be above what people think I'm at. And that's the idea of just pushing constantly and training hard and keeping motivated. So um, Herman, Herman and I had a, had a fair bit of tension over the, the years just simply because I would publicly say I think I could beat him. And people would say, dude, who are you to say that you could beat Herman? You've got no runs on the board. And I'm like, yeah, I get that, but I still think I can beat him. <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah. we have to talk about this. So, you, but we com- you commented on some things. I want to break them down just for the audience. So, one interesting thing you mentioned is starting out feeling that you were not gifted at the sport. I've I've almost and you know that's how I was when I started. I thought that maybe I could, and I decided to I not to to be honest. I decided I was so scared of that not being able to punch people because my arm is short or something being handicapped that I gave up. And also I had some health considerations. So that's my own path. But I started off weak, and I wondered just like you, could I train myself through diligence and hard work to overcome some people that naturally were just good at moving like that? They were let, just. Let me, I want to clarify. I, 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 I said I wasn't strong. I, I actually was really good at arm wrestling. As a kid in school, I, I never lost to anyone in school. I never lost to anyone in the, in the army. Oh, I, I, I was, okay. I've always been a really good arm wrestler. Um, okay. I just didn't know it existed, but I wasn't strong. I wasn't a, a robust but, human. But okay, so yeah. okay, that's why I was just curious because every arm wrestler's interview that I've ever listened to, he always, mm-hmm. every arm wrestler or she always said that they were the best arm wrestler in high school or nobody could beat them until they went to, except Engen, interestingly, that you mentioned. Yeah. Engen's the only person I've ever heard say he was weak, he was, naturally. Well, there, there is one personal friend of mine, Jordan Davis, who he will happily say he was weak. And I can, I can attest to it. He, and he's now elite level. He was truly the weakest guy I've ever seen start in the sport. And now he's phenomenal. So yeah, he's you're a good Jordan now? You said that only uh, Jordan, was- Jordan and I are 50 50. We're, we're genuinely 50 50. Um, Jordan, Jordan just crushed Mario Tembakas the other week. And Mario's got, Mario's legit. Mario's got pins on all the best in Australia. He, he, he pinned Dan Mosier uh, when, when he faced him. So he's real deal. And Jordan crushed him just like two days ago. So, so, so- Jordan. Yeah, we have to give you credit legit. for something. You've made Jordan Davis, and I know their names, I know their last names, and Lachlan Adair, household names in the arm wrestling community. Honestly, that's awesome. Like, I'm very yeah, pleased. Yeah. They should be uh, very grateful, grateful for I, that. And that, that. Honestly, that links back to my, my – I have two missions in the world of arm wrestling. One is in respect to myself as an arm wrestler. I want to be a world champion. I want to ultimately get to being remembered as one of the all-time mm-hmm. greats in the sport. Um, but I also have the, the goal to – to be able to create a, uh, a business structure that allows other arm wrestlers to call it a career. And Jordan and, and Lachlan are the two closest people to me in the sport. And uh, yeah, I filter down to them as much support as I can. We pay for trips to Zloty uh, and all that sort that. of stuff. You brought your friends with you. That's com- very commendable. Yeah, so as that grows, those two guys will grow with it. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but they're both killers, legit now- killers. Talking about the the, uh, I wanted to ask you who you consider the top five people in your weight class to be around the world. Because recently I noticed I was trying to catch up on your content. You mentioned, by the way, your analysis of how you would approach Rustam's setup was really, really uh, unbelievable. Excellent analysis. But uh, on that topic, you mentioned that you think Rustam is the number one person in your weight class. Who are the yeah. number? Not ordered, but who are the top five yeah. you worldwide? Yeah, I, I do there? think. Re- I do think Rustam is, is, is the man at 95 kilos um, uh, thereabouts. So he, he can go down to 90 if as well. But I would also put Sasha. I'd always also put Rob Vigent. Um, and then probably uh, Hadzimir Zaloyev as well. Um, I know he's, he's getting a little bit heavier at the moment, uh, but I think he can be 95 kilos, no worries. Um, and then I guess there's people like, Todd Hutchins and Crassy that all can dip down to that weight if they if they had to, mm. and if they did, I would put them in that conversation. Um, 
there's yeah, I mean people like I think Ongabayev's a little too heavy now, but the Kazakh the Kazakh killers are there and the Georgian, the Rackley. I mean there's 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 Wait, names in your weight class? Oh, I didn't know that. Rack- Rackley's in my weight class, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um these are all guys that are that are at the pointy end for sure, without a doubt. Um I mean even so, so it's it's just who who's cutting weight on the day and making that weight uh, is really the thing. So, but no, Dan Mosier as well. I've got to put Dan in the top top ten in the world for sure at that weight category. I mean, he's proven that. Um, how, people how like Paul Lin. I mean, oh, there's there's a bunch. <laughs> oh, Paul Lin might be in the top ten. I think Paul Lin. I, I suspect for that weight category at 95 kilos, or that Paul Lin's pushing really close to knocking on that door. Yeah. What about left-handed? Could you rattle off names off the top of your head or not as much? To be honest, I... I no, right? It, and you're mainly it, a right-handed yeah. focus? My um, left hand... I, I have done the giant pumpkin for the entire of my arm wrestling career. Oh. Um, eight, eight years, I have not trained my left actively at all. I've competed in my left at every tournament, but I do not train it. Oh, that's great. Actually, that's what I thought of doing when I decided I was going to be handicapped. I said I could be mm. handicapped in one arm. I, mm. I thought maybe my left arm would be good to be yeah. handicapped. For me, yeah. <laughs> so for me, that was all about just increasing the odds of me reaching my goal. I said, I've only got X amount of hours in the gym in my lifetime. And uh, for me to have the best chance of making it as high as I can, I'm, I'm putting it all into one arm. So, <laughs> Okay. The, the final thing that you mentioned before we get into our main topic is you mentioned confidence, that you're optimistic about yourself, which of course is a winner's attitude. And most winners... I think have to have a, a, a internal determination. The thing is, most winners don't announce their their optimism publicly. <laughs> so, especially yeah, most yeah. winners that are on YouTube. So, I think that yeah. th- there's an interesting situation. I personally find the series very funny. The, I, I know you know the the, 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 the you mentioned this the delusional yeah. Brian, Brian Bones series, but it's funny maybe as an outsider, but as an insider. Uh, and as a YouTuber myself, I have my own trolls that think I they think I lie about every single thing I say. They they think the worst of me all the time. I don't know if these trolls necessarily are doing that to you or they or maybe they find some things humorous. But does it affect your psyche? And I'm curious how you've not toned down your optimism publicly because you, your latest <laughs> live was just I can I need to, I can beat a lot of people. I could potentially beat Travis Bajant, left handed at least. Thanks. If he doesn't prepare, so there's a lot yeah. of optimism there. Do you, do you not? Do you not think? Think maybe I should stop them from adding to that series. And and, and if you, uh, it, that is just uh, the fact that that's my personality. It's been that way since I was a kid. Um, my sister will will happily nod and agree and be like, "Yes, that is my brother. Um, he's always been that way." And and, and it's. Uh, I remember when I was a kid playing tennis when I was like eight years old and I, I started playing tennis in my local comp. I got put in division four or something straight off the bat. It was, it was an open age uh, tournament. So adults were playing as well. And I was putting in division four. It was just all skill based. And I remember it pissed me off so much that I was in division four. I just wanted to be in division one. And I used to constantly hassle the, the tennis pro there that run the club and said, can you please put me up? To division one can you please put me up to division one and they'd be like no no you need to you need to prove yourself in division four first and i used to hassle so much i used to hang around and wait till someone didn't show up in division one uh when they were meant to and then i'd say look i'll fill in i'll fill in rather than forfeit the match let me fill in and and i did that and i would uh and i would lose but i would progress so much more playing against the division one guys than against the division four guys and and sure enough, it dragged me up, and, and I was always uh, always comfortable losing. I think that, that's the that's the thing that I think sets me apart on a personality level from a lot of people is that I'm really okay getting my ass handed to me, and I actually yeah, that's want what's that. Surprising, you don't you don't feel the like you don't turn against yourself when you lose. Mm. You come no, back I get excited. I genuinely get excited. Like if I go, if I went, I wanted to pull Rob Vigent. If I went and pulled Rob Vigent and got slammed, I'd be. Totally cool with that. And, and the funny thing is, and this is this is what I know pisses people off most, is after losing a match, I will then three months later say, Hey, I'm looking for a match, and it will be someone above the person I know that I smacked. <laughs> but but and that, and that, that's what I've done that consistently, and that's what I know that's what pisses people off. But it's it's actually it's actually and that's again that's me knowing my reality where i'm at i am i do progress fast i am diligent and, and i pro- i progress from a loss 
really well. And often I progress past the person that just beat me. Um, and, and it's, and I, I don't want to get into the psychology of sport, but once you're, once you, once you cap yourself on progression and your, and your own ability, you, you really do, you stay there. And, no, no. And your, your mentality so. is certainly very helpful for your career as an athlete. The mm. question is whether it's helpful for the YouTube <laughs> crowd, well, but, but, but a separate issue. Let's, let, yeah. let me be serious though, Ryan, because mm. the, the one part of our conversation that was public is that on Instagram, I posted this picture. Now I know you didn't know me beforehand and all that. Maybe mm. you thought I was trying to get attention by <laughs> making this clip, but your comment which I won't repeat here, was extremely, you know, let's say extremely confident also. Yep. yep. And it's, it's, it doesn't make sense because, you know, I, the arm wrestling crowd gets very low views. Every time I make a video about arm wrestling, it tanks my yeah, channel's yeah. algorithm. So I, don't, I only do it out of love. So when I saw your comment, I'm like, bro, you're not, what are you yeah, talking yeah, about? I'm not, I'm not helping you with any, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm yeah. really not, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for me, I was looking yeah. at it like, What's going on? But I can under. But so what I was wondering then is, maybe also your confidence is a way that you you seek strength in yourself when you're when you feel put down a little mm. bit. Well, yeah, yeah there, there is. Um, it, I, I won't I won't deny that there's been difficult times throughout my YouTube career and chapters of growth where different waves of resistance have come at me, uh, and it's been heavy. Um, it's it's an evolution. Like I feel like my first three thousand subs everyone supported me so much. It was just positive, 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 positive. And then all of a sudden people start, you just, yeah, you just get the negatives ones. And then, and then when I become, when, when I project my personality, lots of people um, resist it. And, and, and I've had that, I, I knew it was coming because when I, when I started in arm wrestling uh, in, on the Australian level, the same thing happened on a local level. I, I projected confidence that I wanted to get to state and national champion. And people were like, dude, you can't even win your regionals yet. Just just chill. Mm. Um, and it rubbed so many of the Australian arm wrestlers the wrong way. They thought, who's this cocky little shit that's trying to trying to tell us he's going to be great in the sport? Um, You're not the only one. I miss, I once messaged Marlon Kleinsmith, who I used to chat with a lot on Instagram, and told her, one day I will dominate. <laughs> and then I left the sport a year later. So I, I did more ridiculous things than you've ever done. Don't worry. But anyway, I'm not being harsh on you. I was yeah. just curious. Listen, let, let's, yeah, move past this. Cool. let's move into our main discussion. So what I want to ask you is, why don't you fill me in on what I got wrong? Not in my analysis of whether you lied or anything like that, but what is, I don't know the whole conversation. I mean, I only saw clips, my friend Derek from More Place, More Dates, we have a podcast together. I, I realized he reviewed <laughs> your drug testing uh, protocol. Yeah, 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 what was yeah. the, the bulletproof. Uh, RV, stuff. Yeah, the, RV, the interesting thing is that what I didn't understand is that your conversation with RVJ, his, mm. I mostly was watching his clips. I watched a little bit of yours. And what I understood was from him was that he, you guys, so what I understood is this, and then correct me, please. What yeah, I understood yeah, yeah. is you challenged him to a, to a match and he put up a wall and, and about drug testing. You know, basically, I think he was, I don't know why actually the drug, the drug testing wall was put yeah. up, but when it was put up, I imagine that he thought that you're either natural or you can't get natural. And I imagine that initially from, from his uh, explanations, what I understood was that initially you didn't comment directly on the subject, but instead said, I will be willing to take a drug test. And then the Derek basically said, you guys can't really afford the kind of testing that would be necessary. And then sometime in that discussion privately to RVJ, you disclosed that, Hey, I took, what RVJ mm-hmm. said it was, I took some things a while ago. They may still be on my sis- in my system. Now, mm-hmm. RVJ says that this was a private conversation. Then you made a video about it, saying not about RVJ's private stuff, but about yours, mm-hmm. saying disclosing to the public. Yeah, yeah I mentioned this yeah. to RVJ. First of all, I wonder why you would mention it publicly. And <laughs> second of all, when you meant, so explain it to me. What was the course yeah, yeah, of it? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you it as honest and as accurate as I can give it to you. Um, the RVJ topic of me potentially facing him um, wasn't actually my initiation. It was WAL posted a picture of RVJ and said, who should face RVJ in 2021? And they did that on Instagram and Facebook. My name got tagged a lot. And I found that to be a compliment. I was just happy that fans of the sport were tagging me going, oh, look at that. People think I'm worthy of a match with RVJ. Isn't that nice? Um, so I made a video saying kind of exactly that. Hey, got tagged a bunch that's awesome. Really appreciate the support. I'm ready. If you want me to have a match with RBJ, I'm ready. 
I'll be, and that set the the ball rolling of the of a potential match. And RBJ, I don't think even responded to that at first, um, but a lot of the internet did respond saying, and a lot of the majority, overwhelming majority of the internet, as you can probably appreciate, given RBJ's reputation versus mine, was on the you don't deserve the match, you haven't had enough yet, yada yada yada. Eventually, there was enough chatter that I think that. Um, that RBJ did provide some degree of response and it kind of then blended into the arm PR stuff that was going on. There were bicep lifts and all this sort of stuff. And my lifts looked ridiculous on form, but RBJ's lifts looked perfect on form. And the conversation kept on going about this potential match. And um, I was making points that, Hey, that's cool that your biceps better than mine. I would intend on using side pressure. And eventually it got to the point where I think where Rob actually said, look, 50 grand drug test that anyone can face me on the planet. And he thought, I think Rob believed that that was going to be the end of it because it was going to be an unobtainable amount of money and an unobtainable circumstances with, with drug testing. Um, and, and, and I think Rob's actually had that offer on the table for anyone for, for many years. Uh, he's had that drug tested six months worth of drug testing. I think he's, he's what he would say six months worth of drug testing, natural fight. He'll take on anyone in the world. Um, I could be wrong in that, but I think that that's been RBJ's thing for a while. So I was just like my business Question. mind. Would he, he would yeah. take on anyone uh, to receive 50 or would he put up 50 also? I, I, he would bet 50 grand against oh, someone, yeah. personal okay. bet. I think so. He would put 50 and he'd expect them to put 50. And I, I think, um, but anyway, so my business mind starts going on in my head and I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm like, there's got to be a way. Uh, there's got to be a way that we can make this happen. 50 grand sounds big, but I'm like, no, I think I could do it. I think I could come up with ways and strategies. And I formulate a plan in my head of how we can potentially raise 50 grand to put on the table. Um, and I say to RBJ, look, let's, let's actually talk about it. We get Neil Pickup involved and we have a, we, we, we have a three-way call and a conversation about, is this possible? And, and, and we, we conclude with, at this stage, yes. At that point in time, I was, I said, I've got twenty thousand dollars that I can commit to it. Um, I would need to raise the rest, and um, we started negotiating. All right, what would that twenty be spent on? And there is where um, a critical disagreement happened, and it got blown out of proportion very quickly and, and overridden by another subject. Um, the the as you said, Derek reviewed the the testing that uh, we'd proposed, and and Rob had proposed testing through what's the you'd probably help me. What's the name of the organization? The independent organization that WADA. I don't I don't know what the I'm not. A it wasn't WADA. It was it was like WADA, but but not not. That's with well, not v, WADA. I think. Yeah, yeah, VADA, yeah, VADA. VADA. It was that and and uh, he, Rob spoke to Simon Berichoa, and we're getting an appreciation of what it might cost, and we and we. We came back with, I think there's going to be 10 grand worth of testing. Now, at that point in time, as you, you, you mentioned, I thought, all right, well, I need to have a, uh, an open and honest conversation with Rob about what I've taken in the past. Um, and he needs to be okay with that. Uh, I need to know if he's okay with that because if he's not, if he wants me to have been a clean athlete for my entire life, then we're going to have to cancel the match because that's not the case. Um, but okay, I was here, willing- I have to ask you a question because the audience will yep. ask the same thing, which is- hmm. Why didn't you tell him that from the initial conversation? Like, look, I've not always been natural, but I'll be natural for six months. And well, face- yeah, well, I, I feel I did. That was the purpose of that, that private call. That was the call. Um, I mean, we, I, I wasn't going to make that call to RBJ unless there was feasibly the match actually going ahead. So we, we first of all, worked out whether it was possible because that's, that's that private circle information that you don't just give away to anyone. And, and Rob's, Rob, without knowing Rob personally, Rob's first impressions are he's a loud mouth. So I'm not going to necessarily share my inner secrets with <laughs> Rob. But once the match was somewhat made possible. All right. Then- here's an excellent, excellent chance for us to talk about also. My, most of my listeners are PED users. So it's yeah. an excellent opportunity to talk about the concerns that, that may exist with revealing PED usage. I mean, there's the, yeah. and, and as an athlete, one of the main concerns is sponsorships reflecting well on the sport. And so on. And in fact, in arm wrestling, nobody talks openly about their PEDs, to my knowledge. I can't even think of anybody. Can you? I think Mike Yellow is probably the. He's, I've a, seen he's, him a, he's a part bodybuilder. That's why. Yeah, I've seen him publicly talk about it. 
obviously Larry's talked about it, but he's not. He's only just new to arm wrestling. So I agree that I don't think any of the, the so, elite so arm wrestling. Let's, let's establish that also. In arm wrestling, nobody is openly talking about it. Um, mm-hmm. But the issue, the issue also is yeah, there are other considerations. It may affect uh, people around you or something like that. So yeah, maybe yeah, that is consideration yeah, share, in mind. But, sharing, but, sharing, sharing that with. Um, there's certain crowds, there's certain p- public perceptions. You mentioned sponsors. For me, sponsors aren't an issue because I sponsor myself with my business. So uh, that's all, all good. But there is, I, I, I know that when uh, one of the first people I ever told that I said, look, I've taken stuff that's on the on the, the band list um, was the Australian Arm Wrestling Federation president. And I said it to him because I wanted him. I said, look, dude, if you want, if you want me not to compete in an Australian tournament, I'm happy not to because I've, I've taken stuff before. Mm. So, um, and he was like, no, look, to be honest, there's, there's a million people out there that are probably doing that. It's, it's fine, whatever. But it's, it is an interesting taboo subject because people cast judgments on it pretty harshly. And I, like, I've always been someone who genuinely thinks that um, I, I'm actually very, uh, I'm not very knowledgeable on PEDs at all. I'm really quite clueless. But I've always thought that done safely and done correctly, that there, there really are actually a lot of benefits to it as opposed to the risks. And, and I don't know, I, I, I genuinely think that, that PED use gets looked upon quite poorly by uh, society. And, and I, I agree that it's, it's great to just not put anything in your body ever and just be purely what your body is. That's probably the smartest thing we could do if we want to live for a long time and all that sort of stuff. I don't know. But, um, but I do feel like there's a judgment cast on it. Uh, that's, well, I mean, that's just, you're from Australia. Misplaced. You're from Australia. One of the largest drinking c- countries in the world. Also, I mean, <laughs> and Australians are also very fond of steroids, although they don't like to let it over the border, but I think that it's yeah. a better choice than for example, going to the pub twice a week, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. doing, obviously there's you can go the Seplenkov and uh, Levon route in which you're mm. just using everything under the sun using insulin using everything I mean I, I don't know about Devon yeah. I mean uh, sorry uh, Seplenkov Levon Seplenkov Devin, Devin Seplenkov yeah. but but about Levon there's it's clear that that guy is using insulin as well so you mm. can use you can use everything and and there are bodybuilders who take that route and powerlifters but there are also mm. ways to mitigate for 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 the dangers which is really w- one of the major parts of what my channel is about so my mm. channel tries to promote harm reduction strategies uh, for athletes. Well, that's one of our mm. main goals. So we very much agree with you. Everybody, well, I, I, I owned, uh, when I got out of the military, I opened a supplement store. And so I was interested in strength and I was interested in arm wrestling. And I, and I, I straight away started reading and trying to work out. Um, I was well and truly intimidated by the idea of steroids at that point in my life and was reading and everything. I was like, hopeful that creatine for instance was going to make a world of difference to my strength and i and i i watched my data i'd jump on I, I, and i experimented with every supplement within the supplement industry that was just an over-the-counter supplement possible and i, I went to um sure, i'm having a mind blank at different times i tried it cost me way too much money that was like wow these things are rip-offs for uh not psalms what are the, what was before psalms that was Pro popular hormone? in supplement Pro hormones, yeah. yeah. I randomly would like find a supplement store that was selling a pro hormone that was hadn't yet been banned or something. Wild West, and, and it was still still being able to be sold in in retail outlets, and would try that and would watch all my data, and nothing ever seemed. I didn't. I didn't. None of that ever seemed to. I noticed a thing in in me at the time, and I always just thought, okay, these are really expensive, and I don't feel like they do much. I don't know if they did it much. They might have just messed me up at the time. I don't know. Um, but I was always interested in what edge is there that I'm allowed to have um, within that sport. And, and, and I was always pr- approaching, approaching that. Uh, like I said, I, I very clueless, still very clueless on, on PEDs to the full extent. Um, but it's always been something that I've, I've thought, yeah, okay. I, I've seen that it's in sport. I don't feel like I've been naive enough to think that it's not. I've been... No, it's everywhere um, in all sports that that have a lot of money. Everybody is on PDs. Everybody, yeah. and and, uh, and I've, I've had I've almost been, everybody at the high leagues. 
Yeah, and that's, and that's, honestly, that's honestly why why Herman and, and RVJ interest me so much is because they're so unusual in wanting mm-hmm. in competing and wanting to compete at the highest level, but having that reserve. So that to me is and to my audience probably is more fascinating. We understand your you know your if you want to mm-hmm. be an athlete, you want every tool on deck so you could use your mind to differentiate yourself from your competitors. When you have less yeah. tools, you, your brain can't help you as much. You're just, you know, it's brute force. <laughs> when you add more variables, diet, you know, sleep, uh, st- uh, per- not just steroids, but all kinds of performance enhancing drugs, which are really underutilized in arm wrestling, by the way. But hopefully we'll mm. be changing that soon. But I cut you off. Originally, you were saying, so the, the, the discussion, that's when the discussion came about. I've used this a little while ago. Why did yes. you go and reveal it on your YouTube channel afterwards? That was, um, the, 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 I remember the phrase that I used. Uh, and I, did, I didn't, I don't, it wasn't as big a reveal as it, people played it out to be. I used the term, I, I was really happy that um, RBJ and I were progressing down this potential match path. And RBJ had expressed to me that the reason he wanted the testing was not because of he wanted to make sure I was not on anything, but it was a much bigger picture. He wanted to show that the sport can be done under that light and and just make a positive change. He's a big believer in in no PD use under any circumstances. And he wanted to demonstrate that to the world that it can be done um validly. So for he I, I, I admired that. And when I made that so I, I jumped on and made a video kind of happily celebrating that we're doing this and it's gonna gonna be good and all this kind of stuff and kind of sharing that view that RBJ had expressed with me. And as part of me saying that, I thought at the time, and I, I made the comment on that video that I've taken things that were on the banned list in the past. That was all I said. I Is didn't that say the what. first time you publicly ever said that? Yes. Oh. That was the pu- first time publicly I'd ever said that. I said, I've taken things that are on the banned list in the past. I said it about that quickly. And, uh, and I didn't say what. And I wasn't prepared to say what um, in that video. It wasn't the time. It was just a just part of that. And so that, that was the only thing that I said and, and and again and I said that because I already had shared in small circles small trusted circles the tr- what I had taken at different times and I as a public figure in the sport I didn't want that to be held against me now that I was going into this tested scenario yes it was good that Rob knew that that I had taken stuff in the past but I didn't want the world to think that I was saying that I'd never taken something in the past I was happy for the world to know because like I said, I'd told people already and I didn't want the grapevine from those people to get out and say what Ryan's now claiming natural, where he's saying where well, I know for a fact that he has taken something in the past. So mm-hmm. that was why I said that it was a, a gentle, gentle lead of look. Yep. Okay. I have taken things in the past that were on the band list, but I'm going into this match and I will, be, we will be doing this testing protocol for this match. So the funny thing is, I, I just remembered today before you came on the show, a few hours before you left a comment on my on my YouTube saying, I never claimed natural. So, I, which was, interesting. I don't know why you meant because we we're just about to talk. But anyway, you mentioned that. That, that, that was from a few days ago. That was that was before we spoke that I think I left that comment. But anyway, the, the, the interesting thing is this. Do you understand what I was what I was criticizing? You know, I, I know that the the title of that clip and the mm. and the thumbnail of the biggest yeah. fake natty in arm wrestling maybe yeah. uh, glimpses over the fact that you admitted you were not a natural mm. at some point. But my issue was my you know extreme I awareness. On. I have an yeah, extreme yeah. awareness because I actually one of the only people you'll ever meet completely went yeah. off hormones for three years. And I saw my voice regress within six months. I saw the change in my musculature and I've seen it in a lot of people. I don't make natty or not videos like my friend Derek does, but (laughs) I found it interesting because I remember I had not seen you for two and a half years. So I flipped on your channel and before I knew about this RVJ stuff, I was like, oh, his voice got a lot deeper. And then I noticed, (laughs) well, you have a beard. Well, before you used to shave, so I can't tell if if your beard hair got thicker or not. I can't tell. I noticed you changed your haircut also, that has nothing to do with it. But then I saw you arm wrestling and I said, wait a minute, this guy has interesting musculature now. It's not where he trains necessarily. It's also on, you know, back a little bit on your shoulders. And and so on. I think you know about the changes in your body because you flex often now. You have a side... (laughs) side vein on your bicep which is very rare you have a side vein there yeah 
these are not telltale signs. It's just because I had seen you two years and a half ago. I said, well, this looks yeah, like me yeah, when yeah. I go on hormones. I mean, my, it just this just <laughs> happened on my channel. I went back on, I'm not on a steroid cycle, but I'm on a, a few hormones, just a hormone replacement uh, for the last two months. And if you go on my channel, go four months ago, hear my voice. Well, I was a little fat four months ago. Go six months ago, hear my voice and come back here and you'll notice this change. So I noticed these things. And what my impression was, I thought, I didn't know the backstory and I didn't know your constraints. My impression was this guy is telling people he used them a while ago. And in reality, I can swear that he's been on a hormone within the last six months yeah. because I know yeah, how things that's, that's, that's cool. Yeah. And, and that's cool. And you're correct. The, the thing was, uh, again, the way that I publicly let it out was just, just gentle because again, I, I no, was it not makes sense now, but yeah, it makes yeah. sense now, but I was just yeah. bringing it up because I wanted to explain myself also, because a lot of people, yeah. You have a lot of supporters too. They came on my channel and said, well, what are you doing trying to defame this guy? He, he never said he wasn't natural, but yeah. this was the, the issue. But I hope it's... Well, it makes and so with the, uh, just finishing the RBJ thing, like all of that, one of the one of the things that was, was disappointing for me in the way that, that we talked about criticism from the internet and whatnot is that when a, a large portion of the internet took it, that the reason I that the match fell over was because I was worried I was going to test positive or something like that, or that it was PED related. It really wasn't the case. For me, the match came apart. There was the critical disagreement on, on that initial 20 grand. Yeah. 10 grand was to go on to uh, testing. I agreed with that. Rob wanted the other 10 for an appearance fee. And I said, I, I can't give it all to you because I need to get to wherever we're going and have money as well to pay for accommodation and travel. Um, so I was trying to get five for myself and give five to Rob for an appearance. And then I said, and from then on, anything we raise, we'll, we'll renegotiate and spread. Um, five grand wasn't sufficient for Rob to make the match worthwhile. And I couldn't afford anything more. That was truly for me anyway. That was the point where I said, well, we can't, I can't progress. And then all the other stuff blew up. No, I think that was, playing. yeah, I think that was, to be honest, if anyone paid attention, that was clear. It was a financial thing at the end. It wasn't a refusal for you. I mean, but let's, let's keep the audience to understanding something. I, I, there is a point of drug testing an event in the sense that you put this person, at the, if somebody was using hormones, you put them at a slight disadvantage. There's a there's an advantage and a disadvantage to using hormones, depending on how much you use them. I don't think you use them enough, to be honest, to have a long standing six month at a great advantage. But I don't know what you've used exactly. But I, I assume it's not that great. But the, the disadvantage, of course, is that if you've been on hormones the wrong way, you won't recover very easily. So you go in there hypogonadal with low testosterone levels, maybe lower than your opponent, probably lower than RVJ, especially. You could tell this guy looks like he's on steroids when he's not. So so you go with that disadvantage. But we should make clear to the audience also for everybody to know that if you have used hormones for long enough, your bones will be thicker, your muscle will be a little bit different. And I know this myself, when I went off hormones, I didn't work out much, but when I used to work out, my muscle would grow in a different way, very rapidly and a little bit different. So there are those long, long acting things. So I really think that there's not much point testing people. Um, you know, it's, it's really gets in the way of sports and really we want to see athletes perform at the top level. You know, it's, if somebody does say they're natural, that's that's an exceptional thing. But it really, I don't feel like we can look at the mm. WAF testing, for example, how it goes. It's basically luck of the draw, supposedly. Yeah. And and if they do, they caught my friend Dimitri Trubin and his wife, I think, at the thing. So people are just, they're gearing up there and then, you know, hoping for the best. <laughs> so I think this, yeah. it yeah. doesn't well, really work and it's not very useful. And to be honest, it, it reduces the viewing pleasure. Yeah, I, I agree. And like I've taken the personal stance that, that I want to become the world's best arm wrestler is my goal. That's a huge goal. And I, I've also said that I'm not going to go and compete in WAF. I'm not gonna, I've am not. i offered not to compete in my Australian nationals. I've offered I won't compete in IFA. And that's out of respect for every, anyone in those categories that, that has never taken PEDs and, and won't. Oh, and, and Yeah, so oh, that's why I... Oh, huh? no, you No, no, I won't. I'm, I'm not going to go... Okay. Well, no, I'm, I, I'll go to Zloty because I know that they're not testing and everyone there is on gear. Yeah. Um, well, 90% of them, I reckon, in Zloty are probably on something. Um, certainly the ones that are po on the podium are. Um, and Actually, I'll pull super yeah. matches and, and, and keep climbing the ladder that way. There's a slightly funny topic on this issue. The the I'm not going to mention his name, but the owner of the Zloty Tour actually has a huge case of gynecomastia, which he has not 
taken care of for years. It's the most extreme mm-hmm. case I've ever seen because he used to be, I yeah. think, a bodybuilder also in addition to being an arm wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a very interesting, if anyone wants to look into it, it's a really interesting <laughs> scenario. But Ryan, I have to really thank you. Uh, for the honest you know, I talked to Ryan privately. He reached out to me after, you know, that, uh, that about poorly titled video, which uh, originally upset you. Uh, you've been a gentleman in private. And uh, I really hope to talk to you further. And maybe we'll get you on again in the future. Now, coincidentally, RVJ finally responded to me. And I'm interviewing him tomorrow. So not about the subject. Hopefully our hopefully our stories line up perfectly. <laughs> no, I think they did originally. That, that the, yeah. Everything he said was very similar to that. My comment was just about one thing, which I think you've agreed to also. And the reason probably that I thought you were misrepresenting yourself is just because you were not open about all the details and you revealed what yeah, you yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get it at the time. Yeah. And that's the reason. Yeah, very much. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and there, there will be, I, I don't know. I suspect there'll be a time in the future for me where I actually will be very comfortable being very specific publicly. I don't know. I feel like that's, that's coming. Um, but we'll see. And in, in, in the meantime, in the meantime, it's, yeah, it's just not the I right space think- for it. Well, there's also no re- real reason to, to be honest. You guys are using the wrong stuff. You don't know what you guys are doing. There's, you're not going to teach anybody anything. <laughs> Let's have private discussions first and then later. Yeah. I'm not saying you specifically, but all the arm wrestlers I know are doing random stuff. It's, re- it's really interesting. But we'll talk about that later, hopefully. Hey, Ryan, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you, really. I and I, and I apologize if I hurt your feelings with the way I titled that first video. You really no, that's fine. I really, I really actually appreciate this opportunity. This opportunity... Um, helps helps set the, the the just the story straight for uh, for those people that had misinformation so yeah I we're always it. about the truth we're not about uh, putting people down or anything like that and we're about giving everyone a fair shake thank you so much Ryan. we'll talk we'll talk thank soon you.